wilderness. Turn to Hebrews chapter 9. The amount of times Jesus Christ is represented in these things is just incredible also. From the veil, going into the veil, from each one of these offerings, of course, Jesus Christ is the perfect Lamb of God that shed His blood in order to, to make the atonement for our sins. But also even this, um, the scapegoat, is another reference of Jesus Christ. It's another aspect of our salvation. It's another way to help us to understand what Jesus did for us. Going all the way back to when they bring two goats and they cast lots and basically one of them's chosen to live and the other one's chosen to die. And the one that is, you know, the blood is shed basically allows for the other one to be able to go free. And this is one great picture of our sal salvation. Jesus Christ substituted himself and took all of our, you know, was able to shed his blood so that we can go free. But when you, and that's, again, these symbolic references, um, there's many applications for them. They don't all follow all the way through because when you look at it from that standpoint, it's not like we just keep our sins and just go wander in the wilderness. The scapegoat also represents Jesus Christ in the sense that he has taken our sins and removed them from us as far as the east is from the west. So he's taken all of our sins that we own upon himself and has just taken them away to be just gone out in the wilderness, is basically just, just gone out from us forever, never to be mentioned again never to be heard or seen from again. God has, has forgiven us of our sins and separated us from them as far as the east is for the rest through Jesus Christ being that offering, being that scapegoat, taking our sins to hell and shedding his blood on the cross to pay for them. So many great references here all pointing to Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 9, we're going to see now in the New Testament the reference back to what we just read in Leviticus. Verse number 7 is where we're going to start reading. The Bible says, But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost this signifying, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. So he's explaining from based on what was happening before, what was going on. He says, into the second, that's, that's the, the most holy place. He says, only the high priest went there once every year. And he said, not without blood. Again, it's just making sure you understand it's not without blood. You're not, he was not able to make it into the holy place without blood. There had to be shedding of blood. I'm making a big deal about this also because there are people out there that will claim that the blood really isn't that important. You'll see the blood references being removed from modern translations. You've got people like John MacArthur who will say, oh, well, the references to the blood is just a euphemism for his death, that Jesus just had to die, and that the actual blood really doesn't have that much significance. Uh, no, John MacArthur it actually has a lot of significance. Now, he said that a long time ago, and there was a big deal made about it, like probably 20 years ago, but he's never changed his position on it either. And there's still a lot of people that look to him as some great resource and some great reference. And the guy's a heretic. Amen. If you're going to deny the blood of Jesus Christ as being not that important, that's pretty blasphemous. I'm sorry. That's, that's, he's a heretic for, for even suggesting that. I don't know how you could read through the scripture. There's so many ways that it's mentioned about the blood being shed and the blood being the atonement and that the blood has to be there and that there was never any forgiveness without the shedding of blood. And we're going to see in a minute how the first covenant was not made without the shedding of blood. Neither was the second covenant. They all had to have blood. And you can see it literally physically happened. There was literal blood being shed in that first covenant. It wasn't just referring to the death of the animals of the goats. So then if, if it was just a death, then why are they sprinkling blood? Why are they pouring out the blood in the manner that they did ritualistically? Why would that even be important if it's just about the death? 
Of course the blood matters. Why would, it, why would the Bible invest the time of saying, look, the life is in the blood? If the blood just really doesn't matter, it's really just his death. Well, no, it's not just the death that matters, it's the life also. The life of Jesus Christ matters as much as his death matters. 